on this Saturday night, wild winter weather. From blizzards to thunder snow, southern Ontario is slammed by a strange storm. It was just cool, to be honest. I don't know. Like, yeah, it's. I don't think I've seen it before. We'll tell you where the weather system is heading next. Screen time and suicide. What new research reveals about the risks for children. Every hour that they spent on screens actually was associated with a slightly higher risk of uh, future suicidal behaviors. From quiet quitting to quiet promotion, a new troubling workplace trend. Plus, a world record-breaking birthday for these two tiny Canadians. Global National with Bar Nasser. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Much of southern Ontario is digging out after a wild winter storm. The biggest snowfall of the season in the greater Toronto area dropped as much as 30 centimetres of snow in some spots, grounding flights, knocking out power for thousands of homes, and even unleashing a rare phenomenon known as thunder snow. As Taria Isri reports, that storm system is now working its way east. The sky lit up and so did social media with a relatively unusual sight. Oh, that crackling sound rang out across the greater Toronto area. With lightning even striking the CN Tower. We thought it was a transformer that was going and uh, didn't think that it was thunder. It was pretty impressive, I think. I was happy to be inside, though. <laughs> Outside, this Toronto police officer was in the middle of an interview. People that can't move anywhere because of the types of tires or vehicles that they're driving. So, thunderstorm. The wet snow and strong winds created dangerous driving conditions. Hundreds of flights were grounded Friday night and into Saturday morning. The storm has let up, but crews expect the cleanup will last days. The City of Toronto has deployed more than 1,100 pieces of snow removal equipment. As you all saw, the snow came down at an extremely fast rate. And after that extremely fast downfall, clearing driveways is slow going. And certainly it was a very heavy wet snow, and that's significant. A lot of moisture was in this uh, snow, so that was significant because it meant a little bit more difficult to to push it and plow it and shovel it. It was like shoveling concrete, it was so heavy. The sloppy mess is part of the same system that brought snow to California. It's also hitting the national capital and Quebec. It might look like your typical Ontario winter, but it hasn't felt like it. Despite all the snow, it's been too warm to skate on the Rideau Canal. And for the first time in history, it's staying closed all season. It's been a challenge to like see it and walk by it every day and not be able to enjoy it. The usually packed skateway is empty, so the action has moved to the sidewalks. But it's not easy getting around after a month's worth of snow fell in a single day. It's been a very uh, different winter to say the least, but I really miss the canal not being open and uh, I'm hoping it'll all go away soon enough. A different kind of winter many Canadians are ready to part ways with. Taria Isri, Global News, Ottawa. And let's bring in Global News senior meteorologist Christy Gordon now for more on that weather picture and what comes next. So Christy, lots of snow, even thunder snow. What can you tell us about that? Thanks so much, Jeff. Yes, yeah, so an exciting evening, that's for sure, all across southern Ontario. Thunder snow is a rare event, but we do get it about once per season. It tends to happen earlier in the season or towards the beginning of uh, winter and then towards the end as well. So there were dozens of lightning strikes across the region. This is a shot from the Toronto area, and it was all because of this low pressure center, which tracked across southern Ontario and created that instability and thus the lightning. It's the same type of scenario that we would get in the summertime, although there are some differences. For example, thunderstorms in the wintertime tend to not be quite as tall as they are in the summer as well. We get a little bit more cloud to cloud lightning. There was some cloud to ground lightning uh, last night, but overall the thunder itself is not quite as sharp. The snowfall, which there was a lot of it last night, tends to uh, muffle that sound a little bit. Uh, as we uh, also saw th strong wind, uh, wind gusts, easterly winds, look at Toronto at 76 kilometers an hour, so it was lightning, snow, blowing snow, and heavy snowfall 
uh, across the area, anywhere from 15 to 32 centimeters in a 24-hour period. You can see Scarborough there uh, getting the most at that 32, so substantial snowfall indeed. It will take a, quite a while for the crews to be able to clear everything out. Now, we do still have a few more hours of snowfall expected in the Montreal region, but overall, this is going to shift out as we continue through the evening hours. One thing I wanted to point out, though, we still do have a few flurries possible for southern Ontario overnight. It's just a strong northerly or northwesterly flow that's going to kick up those flurries, but otherwise, we are expecting some sunshine tomorrow, which will be nice. And in terms of snowfall accumulation, it will be minimal. We're talking about zero to three centimeters. I think the biggest uh, issue over the next little while will be that we'll see uh, some melt during the day with that sunshine, milder conditions, and then freezing at night. So that could cause some problems. Jeff, back to you. All right. Thanks, Christy. And winter storms are also wreaking havoc south of the border, producing tornadoes and heavy rains that left at least seven people dead. Kentucky's governor says at least two tornadoes touched down as a storm system ripped through the western part of that state. Winds of nearly 130 kilometers an hour were reported, enough to blow tractor trailers right off the road. The storm is now moving to the northeast, bringing heavy snow and sleet from Michigan to New York State, where more than 30 centimeters of snow has already fallen. And turning to Ukraine now, Canada's defense chief just wrapped up his first trip to that country since Russia's full-scale invasion. General Wayne Eyre met with Ukrainian military officials and discussed bilateral defense cooperation. His visit comes as Russia appears on the cusp of its first major victory in months. Reggie Cicchini reports. Under constant Russian attack, there are fewer and fewer safe passageways into and out of Bakhmut a city in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region where fewer than 5,000 people remain. We wanted to stay, but how can we, this resident says. It's time for us to go. While Ukraine has stabilized the front line, how long it can hold it in place is unknown. It's on fire, this soldier says, but Ukraine will live. Bakhmut has been a target for months. Weakened, it's now almost entirely encircled, according to the leader of Russia's mercenary Wagner Group. Moscow sees this city as a doorway to the Donbass. Experts argue the town is small and simply an obsession for Russia's president. And while securing it has come at a steep price, victory could too. It will be a tactical victory for Putin, uh, but it will be a strategic defeat because he's chewed up so many units uh, trying to take Bakhmut. Russia's confidence is getting a slight boost. Its defense minister even making a rare trip into what it calls Russian-controlled Ukraine, awarding medals to his soldiers. Good luck, success, and come home alive, he told them, before meeting with military leaders where more weapons and training were discussed. The trip comes just one day after the U.S. announced another $400 million in crucial aid. These contributions are making a significant difference, enabling Ukraine to defend its sovereignty. For Ukraine, its future remains on the line. But for Russia, it comes down to the future of one man. He's a dictator who has cast the dice in a failing military effort, and he feels it's necessary to have what he can be sold as a victory in order to prevent some kind of social explosion at home. And while Ukraine says it won't withdraw from Bakhmut, it's quickly running out of time and resources. Reggie Chikini, Global News, Washington. Ukraine's first lady says prosecutors are now investigating 171 cases of sexual violence allegedly committed by Russian troops. Olena Zelenska says those are only the official numbers, adding, quote, we don't know how many suffer in silence. She vowed those responsible will not go unpunished. Zelenska was taking part in a panel discussion on sexual violence and war crimes today, along with the president of the European Parliament. I'm the mother of four sons. I would like to be able to tell them when Ukraine wins the war that everybody will be held accountable for the crimes that they have committed and the atrocities that we have seen committed against the brave Ukrainians. While many of the sexual abuse victims are women, Zelenska says 39 are men and 13 are minors. 
For days now, the Liberal government has faced calls and political pressure to hold a full public inquiry into allegations Beijing tried to interfere in Canadian elections. Well, so far, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has resisted, saying parliamentary committees are already investigating. But that line has done little to quell the calls, including from some experts who say the government should start planning new legislation now. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief, Mercedes Stevenson, has more on that. Mercedes. Jeff, there are lots of allegations and questions around the foreign interference file, but not a lot of transparency or clarity. This week on the West Block, we go looking for answers with some people in the know, two top former civil servants who were in their positions under the Trudeau government. We'll sit down with Arthur Wilczynski, a former senior public servant at a Canadian intelligence agency, and Michael Wernick, the country's former top bureaucrat, who was clerk of the Privy Council in 2019, a ahead of the election that took place later that year. Warnick says foreign interference is a serious threat that the government needs to act on to reassure Canadians. Well, I think uh, one of the driving issues here is retaining the confidence of Canadians, trust of Canadians in not just elections, but their political institutions, their democracy, in politicians. So the issue is much broader than where it started a few weeks ago about China's role in a specific election. I, I think we do now have an issue about uh, retaining Canadians' trust in, in their de democratic process. Over the last week, MPs grilled senior national security officials on the details of the China interference file at a parliamentary committee looking into the issue. The committee ultimately recommended a public inquiry take place, something the Prime Minister is resisting so far. Wernick says the government doesn't need to wait for a public inquiry, though, to do something now. We don't have to wait a year and a half for its findings. I can tell you the findings already. It will recommend that we take the Australian and UK models of foreign interference legislation and registration and bring them to Canada. So there's nothing stopping our politicians from working on that legislation in parallel. The government could commit to table a bill like that before the summer break and, and our politicians could debate it, amend it, make it better and pass it by the end of the year. Arthur Wilczynski, who was the Associate Deputy Minister at Canada's Signals Intelligence Agency, says foreign interference is a top priority for intelligence agencies in Canada and that more can be done to level with Canadians about what has been going on. So I think as transparency is essential, and I think transparency uh, is something that we can do more of within the security intelligence community. We'll have more on that story, plus a look at how all of this might shake out as MPs return to Parliament. That's what's ahead on the show this week. Jeff. Thanks, Mercedes. And as you mentioned, you can watch that full interview tomorrow on the West Block. The link between excessive screen time and suicide. Coming up, what new research reveals about the risks for children who spend hours staring at screens. Plus, how these Torontonian twins landed a spot in the Guinness World Record books. Trying to moderate the time that children spend staring at their screens is a familiar challenge for families, but now research from the U.S. is adding new urgency to that discussion. The study found a link between excessive screen time and suicidal behaviors in preteens. Researchers say it can lead to social isolation, cyberbullying, and sleep disruption. But as Catherine Ward explains, there are some simple steps families can take to mitigate the risks. Television, tablets and texting, screens are everywhere. Screens are here to stay and to some extent um, people need to use them for communication, schoolwork and increasingly daily work. However, a recent study raised some red flags when it comes to how excessive screen time could influence children 9 to 11 years old. Every hour that they spent on screens actually was associated with a slightly higher risk of uh, future suicidal behaviors. The study looked at more than 11,000 kids in the U.S. Participants reported an average of four hours of total screen time per day. Each additional hour of total screen time was then associated with a 9% increased risk of suicidal behaviors when followed up two years later. While these numbers might sound alarming at face value, experts caution not to jump to any conclusions. I think the jury is still out as to whether or not um, screen time causes suicide and mental health or potentially kids who already are depressed are just using screens more. With others saying there can be benefits to screen time. 
They mentioned multiplayer games as potentially being a source of, of bullying, but could also be a source of social interaction and uplift and, and connection and, and an important benefit. So it really isn't about the screens. It's about what's happening on the screens and what are you doing with them. Regardless, when it comes to healthy screen time, caregivers have a leading role to play for modeling good habits. Avoiding screen time, particularly before bedtime, or having screen-free times during family meals so that you can focus on eating. And creating connection wherever possible. One of the really interesting things that's come up in this research year after year is that kids don't report wanting to spend all of their time playing on their iPads or watching TV or YouTube videos. They talk about wanting to spend more time with family, with grandparents. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, quiet promotion. Why the latest workplace trend isn't all it's cracked up to be. Welcome back. You've probably heard of quiet quitting, the term for employees who put minimum effort into their jobs. Well, there's a new workplace trend for 2023 called quiet promotion. And as Anne Gaviola explains, it may not be as beneficial as it sounds. Being quiet promoted is when you get more responsibilities, you take on more work, you get to do more things while keeping the same job title and uh, keeping the same pay. Quiet promotions don't come with a pay bump or a title increase, just more work. Besides, you get paid in experience, am I right? A promotion sounds good, but beware the quiet promotion that is exploitation. Career strategist Sweta Regmi has experienced it herself. I've been there, seen that as well. And when I reflect back, I felt like, you know what, that was a wage theft and labor abuse. Quiet promotion, also known as quiet hiring, has become more common in this labor market where job vacancies abound. It could be weeks or even months before you fill a position. The other reason for it, though, is coming out of the pandemic, a lot of companies are, are not flush financially, so they can't afford to hire a new person. It could lead to career advancement. It can be very positive for an employee that is getting the opportunity to learn new skills, to learn new ways of doing things. But it can also lead to more vacancies. If the employers are not going to the root cause of what's causing them to backfill it all the time, what's causing them to cross-train people all the time, there's going to be burnt out. People are going to quit. U.S. consulting and research firm Gartner identified quiet hiring as one of the top workplace trends of 2023. It comes on the heels of 2022's quiet quitting, which refers to doing your job but nothing beyond what's required. Quiet quitting has given rise to bare minimum Monday, which, as the name suggests, is a form of presenteeism, or rather, resenteeism. Some suggest quiet promotions should be treated like internal hires. I would like to see the compensations and the job descriptions and the contracts, and that would be the right way of hiring internally and compensating them with a fair package. In other words, promoting loudly. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Up next, Indigenous culture and coding. How a Saskatchewan school is teaching tech to First Nations and Métis students. Welcome back. A pair of Ontario twins are celebrating their first birthday by landing a spot in the Guinness record books as the world's most premature twins. Adia and Adriel Nadaraja were born on this day last year after just a 22-week pregnancy. Their parents say doctors gave the babies around a 0% chance of survival when their mother went into labour. She was transferred to the neonatal intensive care unit at Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital, which offers care for in infants born after 22 weeks. I was experiencing a lot of bleeding and I didn't know if I could hold the babies in until they got to the 22 week and zero mark. Uh, but I knew that I had to hold the babies in because if I didn't, they wouldn't be alive. Now, one year later and after nearly six months in intensive care, the tiny twins are marking their first birthday with not one but two world records. They're also the lightest twins at birth at a combined weight of just 750 grams. Happy birthday. A Saskatchewan High School is preserving Indigenous culture and history by looking to the future. Students are receiving lessons in computer science and coding and then learning how to use those skills to remix Indigenous music. Cabby Mally Theron reports.
It wasn't just binaries and algorithms at this coding event. Sound and rhythm were just as important. Students from Bethlehem Catholic High School and St. Joseph High School got to remix indigenous music through coding. It's really interesting how they put coding and music together since I'm a band student. Um, music has also always been my passion. You know, you're going to hear this bass line forever. It's part of Your Voice is Power, a program that teaches computer science while learning about Indigenous history in Canada. They want to encourage more students from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds to explore the tech world. This educator is on board. Definitely with the direction that our industry is going, it's important that the students get more involved with um, computers and how to code programs and use all those different skills in the real world. According to a 2020 conference Board of Canada report, fewer than 2% of people working in STEM are Indigenous, creating a need for a computer science program with Indigenous education. Friday's lesson plan included Saskatoon-born Indigenous hip-hop artist Dakota Bear speaking to the crowd on his journey to pursue his dreams while staying true to his culture. That message hitting home with Alex Truong. We're all just human beings, like it doesn't even matter where you're from, whether you're indigenous, Asian, anything, we just, we all need to support each other. While some students aren't sure if this is their destined career choice. Um, maybe, you know, it, it's, it's all like kind of complicated, you know, I'm still you know, young trying to figure things out. It's an experience that this teacher believes these students will look back on. Anytime that they get a day like this where they get to go away and have a different experience, it always imprints on them and gives them memories that they remember for years. Kabi Malitharan, Global News. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight's Your Canada is a very snowy Wycliffe, British Columbia. We love seeing Your Canada, so please keep emailing your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Farah Nasser will be back here at the Anchor Desk with you tomorrow. Have a great night.